You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that music can mean but one thing. It is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. You know what's going on on the commodity of the futures options side of the fence? Well, join us, if you will, for the next hour or so. We'll break it all down together. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Reminding you, whatever you're listening to, hither or yon, this show, all the other shows on our network, make sure you leave those reviews on your platform of choice so new folks can continue to discover the programming as the end of the year is coming up. Everyone's kind of sitting at home wondering what's going on next year, want to look back at the markets and all that fun stuff. We're going to be doing that, so join in. And, of course, keep those reviews coming so other folks can continue to join us as well. Keep those questions coming, too. We do love to hear from you guys out there. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. First, joining me on the old FTSE Russell hot seat, our old friend, Mr. Sean Smith, the managing director of derivatives licensing over there at FTSE Russell Land. Mr. Smith, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. Hi, Mark. It's great to be back. Looking forward to a great show today. Should be a fun one because also joining us once again, for a final kind of end of the year appearance here, holding down the CME Group hot seat, our old friend, the once and future Dr. Vix, a.k.a. Mr. Russell Rhodes, wearing a bunch of hats these days over there at Loyola University, teaching them their undergrads about finance, and then, of course, at EQ Derivatives and a bunch of other fun stuff. Mr. Rhodes, as well as the author of one or two options-oriented tomes. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the program, sir. I love that you call the work that I do tomes. It makes it sound so hoity tidy or, or hoity toity or whatever. So I love that. <laughs> We're here to aggrandize our guests. <laughs> All aggrandize the time. there. You're much more of a words person than I am. 
I do get paid to speak <laughs> after all. All right, with the team assembled, let's kick it all off the way we like to do with the movers and the shakers. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Usually this is the portion of the show where I ask our guest where we should begin our journey, to the light side or to the dark side. But Mr. Rhodes and Sean, you'll like this too. There really isn't a choice this week. There are only three dark side players. <laughs> so uh, not a lot of dark side this week. This might be, I'll have to go back and look, this might be the most biased we've seen this report for the entirety of 2020. And that's saying something because we've seen this thing pretty stark in one direction or the other a lot of times this year. But I can't recall any other time where we've only had three in one direction. So that makes it a little interesting. I guess I'll just rattle off the dark side real quick because they're kind of inconsequential at this point. We got iron ore off 0.04%. Yeah, that's how that's how meager we had to go, listeners, to scrounge up three for you. That's how bullish this week has been. Class two milk, number two off 0.89%. And number one with a pretty actually impressive bullet, we got lumber once again off 13 and about a half percent. It was number one in the other direction last week, number one to the light side last week. And iron, that was off 12, up, I should say up 12.8%. So it was up 12.8% last week, this week off 13 and a half percent. So Interesting couple of weeks for lumber. Iron ore is also number two to the light side last week, up about 8.7%. This week is kind of unched. So interesting times for iron ore as well. Now let's go to the upside. E-mini Russell 2000 having a pretty good week, up over 2%. But that's not enough to break into the madness, the palooza of upside that is going on out there this week. In fact, that only comes in at number 17. That's how much upside there is. Listeners out there ought to be had on their report as beats out the S&P mid-cap 400 and corn right behind feeder cattle. That shows what a crazy week it has been out here. Let's get to the actual top five. Number five, soybean meal up 4.43%. It was number three in the other direction last week, off about 2.3%. Number three, or should be number four, our old friend Arbob. Up about 4.53%, so just a tenth of a percent more up there. Number three, WTI, feeling its oats up nearly 5%, 4.83%. Number two, just talking about Uncle Mike on the option block a little while ago, silver up nearly 9%, 8.97%. He was saying, forget about crypto, let's look at silver. And we're going to talk look at crypto in a little bit as well. There's a lot going on out there. Because number one with a bullet this week, listeners, you could probably guess it, yeah, it's crypto. It's Bitcoin, I should say, up 26.14%. What a big turnaround, because on Monday's Crypto Rundown show, it really wasn't a heck of a lot. It only moved about 100 handles net on the week, and then all of a sudden, it's off to the races now, breaking through. Not It was about 19,000 and change at the time of Monday's show. Broke through not just the 20,000 level that everyone's been looking forward to, and now the 23,000 level coming into showtime. So just a bunch of insanity, I think. We have to start there, Mr. Rose. Do you agree? We've got to start in the crypto land, sir. Absolutely. And this is something that I'm never, ever, ever going to live down. But when Bitcoin was around 4000 my oldest daughter asked if she could uh, put some of her babysitting money into Bitcoin. And I said, sure. Did dad ever get around to opening the account for her? No. So I owe her, an, I, I owe her a, a six-bagger, huh? With it up over 23000 now. Dang. She could have done well with her babysitting money. See, Dad, you're, you're keeping your daughter from wealth and riches, sir. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I deviate into farther down the list real quick? Really quick. Ever so briefly. Okay, real quick. Well, the, the one thing, okay, throw Bitcoin out because you can debate whether or not it's an indication of inflation. But the next 10 um, are all hard products. They're not financial products. Silver, energy, soybean, soybean meal. Platinum, gold, Brent. Uh, it, it makes me wonder if, we, if we're going to have some inflation in early 2021, just looking at what the big performers were. Uh, and, and, you know, some people say that Bitcoin, the cryptocurrencies, might be a good inflation hedge because uh, there's a limited supply of them. But uh, you can say for sure that 10 of the top 11 on that list are things that you would, uh, that, 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 if they keep going in that direction, are going to end up, uh, we're going to have an inflationary 2021. Well, the Fed has been taking their foot off the brakes there from an inflation perspective. So 
a lot of people have been arguing for a while that we probably are poised for a little bit more inflation in the near future. And that certainly has been contributing to the aggressive rise of Bitcoin. Not sure if it's the 3,000 plus handle swing driver this week, but a lot to unpack. Remember, you guys, as always, can play along with the home game, cmegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O, or slash twio, T-W-I-O. By the way, if you use caps on that for some reason, it does not work. So keep it lowercase. <laughs> it's the only URL I know of that is case sensitive, but c'est la vie. I digress. If you do that, you can go into, there's actually a section there for cryptocurrency. So if you're interested in what's going on out there in crypto land, you can look yourself. And coming into showtime, the CME Bitcoin future, which is, of course, based off the Bitcoin reference rate, was at about 23,500. My goodness, what a, what a run. That's up 30, almost 30.5% just this week. Wow, up 5,480 handles just that's a year's worth of uh, uh, that's a great year's worth of appreciation in any asset in a week. So that's what we're looking at out here from an overall uh, overall perspective. The lion's share of the action again. The the futures have been pretty hot and heavy for a while over there at CME. The options are slowly playing catch up, so they're not exactly blowing the doors off yet. That said, about 500 contracts this week, which of course that's a five x multiplier. So you're talking about 2,500. Uh, actually coins changing hands out there. Let's look really quickly here. Jan seems to be where the lion's share of the action was, 56.5%. So let's look out there. If you're wondering what this vol is, what the at-the-money vol is out there in the Bitcoin, at least for the options on CME, it's at about an 86 and a half coming into showtime in Jan. That puts it oh up 18 points. Just this week alone, and the front contract, the D's contract, is going away in about a week. That's at almost 100. That's at 97. <laughs> That's up 31 points this week, just from a vol perspective. So uh, insanity across the board. People are always asking. They continue to ask, even though this data is more widely available now, including here, for free. But check it out here. If you, people always want to know what the skew is out there in Bitcoin. So let's do that. Let's look at the skew in Jan. The puts last week, 2.8% cheap. Not a, love, a lot of love for the puts, but they weren't really biased much in either direction. This week, a little cheaper, 3.4%, so not a lot of love for puts. Go figure. It's up 30% in a week. <laughs> Last week, the calls were pretty rich, 12.8%, nearly 13%. This week, they've come in a bit, 9.6%. Now, you may be surprised by that. Say, hey, it's up 30%, but that could also be the fact that we've blown through a lot of strikes out there, and also the fact that the volume is still kind of light on CME options. So take some of those skew readings with a bit of a grain of salt. Usually you need a little bit more paper on both sides of the bid and offer and on all the strikes to really make those skews a little bit more meaningful. So they're starting to materialize and be a little bit more interesting, but still kind of light. The most active contract, go figure, it was the 20,000 calls pretty much across the board in Jan and in Deese. Actually, Deese was 22,000. That was the most active out there. But the big most active contract in Jan and pretty much for the entire week was the 20,000 call. About a fifth the paper going up this week was on that 20,000 strike, which is now a distant 3,000 points in the rear view mirror out there, listeners. <laughs> Mr. Rhodes, I like your analogy. What if you were in one of those, let's say one of those zombie movies, right? And at how they always start. You always wake up in a hospital from a coma and the world's in a zombie apocalypse. Take that and roll it forward, sir, for 2020, if you will. Yeah, no, I, I, people can't see what I, I typed a little note to you, and I, I just had that thought that – and it really initially res, was with respect to Bitcoin, but uh, you know, if you'd, you'd forgotten that you had it and checked it today, you'd be absolutely thrilled over the course of a year. And then, as my mind does, it went down a little rabbit hole. Could you imagine if, if something happened, you got put into a coma on December 17th of 2019 – Woke up today, and the first thing you hear is we've got a global pandemic and the economy has been shut down. So you're thinking, damn, I wish I had been awake to rebalance my portfolio to, to respond to that. And then you check your portfolio, and you actually had a really great 2020. Uh, you, you, it might put you right back into the coma. Yeah, on the surface, a lot of these <laughs> things we're saying here don't make a lot of sense because you're right. You say all those things out loud, you know, massive death rates, 5x. 6x the number of people who died in Vietnam just in the pandemic, hospitals at capacity, you know, all sorts of madness. And yet at all time highs, half of the economy shut down. All time highs, you're right. Doesn't really make sense. Bitcoin, massive recovery this year. A lot of interesting things afoot. Sean, I know uh, you're mostly focused on all things small cap, and there's a lot going on out there as well. Before we get there, I've joked before 
about the the FTSE Russell Bitcoin index. What do you think, Sean? After this week, maybe that's a more interesting conversation. What do you think? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, we, we, as I have mentioned several times in the past, are looking at um, digital assets uh, at FTSE Russell. Um, so we are uh, doing some analysis, talking to clients. It's interesting that you bring that up today, Mark. Well, I have been known to be prescient at least once or twice. <laughs> But since we've mentioned small caps, let's get to them as well, because they've been kind of on top of everyone's radar, as well as, actually, before we get there, before we get there really quick, uh, some other breaking news on the crypto front coming out of CME. People have been asking us, and I've been bugging them forever, what's next? What's next with crypto? Everyone wanted the options. In fact, I did a panel session a, a few years ago now back at a crypto event in Chicago. It was myself, Bill Uluberry, who's been on our crypto rundown show a few times. Uh, Matt Amberson, who's been on our network many times. And uh, Julie, I think she was the chief commercial officer. I think she still is over there at CME at the time. And I asked her back then, a couple of years ago, what was next for CME on the, on the crypto front. And she actually mentioned before even Bitcoin options. This was after the futures had been around for about a year. She thought ETH futures might have been next. Of course, we had to wait a little bit, and then we got the options. But now... The other product everyone's been asking about, the ETH futures, they're coming. CME just announcing it yesterday, I believe. They're coming on February 8th. Our old buddy, Mr. Tim McCorp, saying, based on increasing client demand and robust growth in our Bitcoin futures and options market, we believe the addition of Ether futures will provide our clients with a valuable tool to trade and hedge this growing cryptocurrency. So you know what that means? ETH futures in February, some indeterminate time after that, once the futures start trading hot and heavy, we will see some options. If you've listened to our crypto rundown show and you know anything about the crypto markets in general, ETH is a clear number two uh, to Bitcoin in terms of volume, in terms of price action, in terms of market cap. So it makes a lot of sense that they would dive into that space. And again, the more listed products that exist in the crypto world on lit venues here in the U.S. that are actually regulated means more players can dive in, and we'll see more interesting things going on as a result. So everyone out there who's been asking, when are we going to get some good stuff on the ETH front out of CME? There you go. You got your date. February 8th out there. Fascinating stuff. And now we have to keep on rolling into more fascinating stuff. It is time to dive into equities. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, let's break it all down. Let's set the table out here in the equity volatility landscape because it is an interesting beast these days. Coming into showtime, we saw our old friend RVX, a.k.a. the VIX of the Russell 2000 at about 29.05. So pretty much unched <laughs> from where it was this time last week, down about 0.05 from last week. So interesting how uh, that's been going on. But again, we've seen a lot of movement out there to obviously maintain and sustain these levels of vol out there in small cap land. VIX itself a coming into showtime was at about a 21.65 or so. Puts it up about 0.65 from about last show. So vol creeping up a little bit across the board. Which a lot of people were betting, I know on our vol view show, that the stimulus would come in and maybe crush some of that vol, but not so much here, which makes my prognostication look pretty good for tomorrow. VVIX, a.k.a. the vol of vol, at about 109.5. Again, kind of similar levels to last week, down about half a point. And good old VolQ, the newest addition to the Vol landscape, a.k.a. the at-the-money Vol of the NASDAQ 100. About 23 and a half, up about almost three quarters of a point out there. That puts that, that small cap to large cap spread, a.k.a. the VIX to RVX spread, at about seven, almost seven and a half, about 7.4 points. About three quarters of a point tighter than it was this time last week. So tightening up. A little bit, as we've seen, RVX kind of stay where it is and VIX uh, creep up a little bit. So interesting stuff out there. And then the VIX to VOLQ, so the S&P to NASDAQ, which, again, we talked about is not really not really Macintosh to Macintosh apples, but more maybe like Macintosh apples to like Golden Delicious apples. Similar flavors, but not quite the same thing. So not quite one-to-one. -one. That's at about one and three-quarters points. That's, again, the same as last show. Sean, I know you've been busy out there. Small caps, hot and heavy. I know Brian's been talking about them on OPR. We had Matt on recently. He's been breaking down a lot of the interesting skew developments out there in small cap land. I know Russell was on the other shows not too long ago kind of talking about small caps. I got a feeling he'll be doing that again in a little bit. So small caps are on people's radar here to end the year, Sean. What's been lighting up your tape And I'm sure, a busy week in FTSE Russell, sir? They have. Uh, for 
first of all, it's great to have Russell on the show with us. Russell, just a welcome, and uh, I'm a huge fan of yours, so I, I, I just wanted to say welcome to the show, and I, and I look forward to connecting with you post-show. Yes. We need to catch up. <laughs> but, you know, and he's also got one of those fantastic names, which I just love to say, Russell, right? Yeah. I, I think I say your name on this show at least a dozen times, so uh, <laughs> near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so funny. And I love the funny. hoity-toity comment earlier. Oh, what he, yeah, really it, he, Mark always makes me sound good. I wish my mom was still around to hear Mark sing my praises. <laughs> um, no, and it's, it's it, you know, as far as the small caps go, I really, really uh, have a strong, if, if I had to make, you know, if, if I were in a position where I had to make 2021 predictions, um, small cap outperformance, small cap value outperformance in 2021 is something I think we're definitely going to see. And I almost wonder if uh, people using options to play the upside, which sometimes does contribute to higher volatility, might be having an impact on RVX and keeping it a little bit elevated relative to uh, the implied volatility of some of the other broad-based indices. So, Absolutely. Uh, These, this, yeah. uh, upside, this upside call buying has definitely kept RVX elevated. But just for, st- for some quick statistics for you, um, between November 1st and right now, as you, as you mentioned, uh, small cap value, it's up 28%, um, value. Russell, uh, growth is up 26.5%. So styles are definitely, um, uh, where investors are looking these days. So really interesting that you said that same, same with the Russell one, um, mm-hmm. Those dates, November 1st through now, the Russell 1 value is up 16.3% as well. But overall, small caps, as of yesterday, are outperforming the S&P 500 by uh, 2.5%. Uh, Russell 2000 is up 17% overall for the year. S&P is up 14.5%. So small caps are, are outperforming to the upside. And it's uh, a comment I make on every show it, 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 that it's more volatile. And when it when it rallies, it outperforms, and we're going to see that because it is a, a a more domestic type of index. The weights uh, in the various sectors are a lot different than large caps. You've got uh, financials and healthcare and uh, d- uh, discretionary spending, uh, energy uh, taking off in this last quarter mm-hmm. as well. So you've got uh, you've got uh, different weights and different reasons why the Russell 2000 small cap index of the U S is outperforming right now. And it's really exciting to see. What are your thoughts, Russell? Well, the, the funny thing is it, it much, I think the theme is, can you believe it uh, as far as 2020 goes? But the funny thing is the, the, the one time that we really got small cap outperformance was four years ago when we were going to make America great again. And, um, and Trump was elected. I mean, it was right. the, the biggest outperformance on record. And now he gets defeated in early November. And lo and behold, we're going to make, I guess we're going to make at least uh, America value great again. <laughs> but it, it, it's, I think it's kind of interesting that with the Biden victory, we also had um, some small cap outperformance there as well. So, uh, yeah, in, in, I, I think there's an assumption that uh, the economy and, and our way of life maybe is going to be a little bit less volatile and get back on track in 2021. And that's why it's showing up in, in the Russell 2000. But the, you know, the, the same response to two different election outcomes I found kind of funny. Yeah, actually very, very interesting. But mm-hmm. again, the focus on uh, the, the U.S., uh, our government supporting our uh, our domestic businesses, our small businesses, even with this next uh, economic push from our regulators, um, it's 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 earmarked to help small businesses here in the U.S. So um, we're getting that upside. Not to mention the <laughs> the the COVID vaccine and the, the weight of healthcare stocks within the Russell 2000 is is big as well. So all of those stocks have been uh, benefiting from this. From the, yeah. from the COVID vaccine uh, excitement going on as well. 
Let's break down some of that excitement out here, shall we? Let's look at, speaking of excitement, by the way, the options paper, the flow on fire out here this week in uh, E-mini uh, Russell 2000 options. Over 15,000 contracts on the tape coming to the showtime. That's, that's pretty hot and heavy. And, you know, we we're just talking about outperforming to the upside. When Matt was on, he was talking about the five Delta calls. Uh, everyone's talking about upside, upside, upside. And yet, persistently, the puts have been the dominant player, at least on the CME flavor of the Russell 2000 options. And coming into today's show, that's pretty much exactly what we're seeing again. In fact, uh, right now, coming at showtime, 1973 on the Russell 2000. So, Sean, we might need to have that Russell 2000, 2000 party maybe next week. What do you think? Let's do it. We are going to celebrate 2000 on the 2000. We're not that far away at this point. Up 62 and a half handles or three and a quarter percent just this week from Monday here, listeners. And the most active contract, again, keeping with the equities, is the DEES contract that's going out in about three quarters of a day. But we're not going to break that down. That's 31 and a half percent of the paper. Actually, the biggest print out here yet again this week was on the put side and pretty far out of the money puts as well. Like I said, we're threatening 20,000 to the upside right now. It was the 1310 puts. On the week three contract in January, that has about 29 days to go, that was the big dog out there uh, trading about almost almost a fifth of all the week's paper out here was in these puts, trading about 1,400 yesterday and 1,400 again today of these 1,310 puts. It was closing yesterday, but now same exact amount trading today. So maybe they're reopening. I don't know what's going on. By the way, nearly 3,000 of these bad boys trading very far out of the money puts, which, again, is kind of in keeping with what we've seen out here in the Russell 2000 for a while. Let's, let's keep it out here in the Jan category because this also had about 25% of the paper this week. Let's see what's going on from a vol perspective. Russell 2000 vol, at least in this Jan contract, at about a 26 So off about a point, actually, as we've been rallying a little bit this week. And then we're seeing, let's see, skew-wise, the put 16% rich last week, this week 16.5% rich. And then on the upside, 11% cheap were the calls. This week, 11.5% cheap. So calls coming in, puts getting bid a little bit out there this week. And before we keep on rolling, Sean, I know you've been pretty active. You got some, even some new products coming online soon out there in Russell 2000 options. Isn't that correct, sir? Uh, we do. We do. Uh, very exciting uh, press release today by our partners, SIBO Global. They're launching Russell Mini Options which uh, is a very exciting uh, new product. And I'm sure Russell Rhodes is as excited about these as I am. Um, they're going to be launching those in the first quarter next year. Fantastic. They're going to be one-tenth the size. Um, they're going to be the same size as the options on the ETF. Um, and we are very much looking forward to the launch of those products. I know SIBO has been working, SIBO Global has been working extremely hard, talking to market participants, clients, and there's a real strong demand for this product. And we're very excited to be working together with SIBO Global on this product launch next quarter. Russell, do you get a, a piece? Do you get a piece of the action of licensing from all this Russell using your name, sir? <laughs> I, I don't. The only thing that, that I used sure. to get was every time we had one of those fun trade shows, um, I'd come back to work and, and there'd be all kinds of Russell 2000 stuff on my desk. <laughs> trade show. Trade show. I've got more. I've got more Russell swag than I know what to do with. And then uh, the other thing is when I was over at SIBO uh, and we would be having meetings about uh, supporting the, the different Russell products that trade there, uh, we would refer to FTSE Russell as Rut so that we didn't confuse the company with me. Uh, but they don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> nice to have these, these first world problems, sir. Yeah, one, one just one little last thing with respect to the Russell options. Um, I was looking at the weeklies going into early next year, and the uh, there's n not a big difference on for the implied volatility for the options that expire just before the Georgia Senate race and just after in many markets. But there's actually a little bit of a there's about almost a two two point difference with the at-the-money implied volatility for the December 31st versus the January 8th options. So the Russell 2000 may be one of the markets that people are expecting a little volatility around based on what kind of outcome we get with respect to the, the direction of the Senate uh, the first week in January. I've been looking around for markets that might be bracing for it, and this is really the first one that I've found that looks like it's paying attention to it. 
Yeah, we've been talking about what could potentially be keeping the Vol products elevated right now, and the Georgia runoff is certainly a candidate, and that certainly does apply out there to small caps as well. We'll keep an eye on that. It's going to keep on rolling to another product that's been having a hot and heavy week. Yep, it's time to talk energy. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's break down the old Texas tea, the black gold. You know, Russell, how many times have you been on this show over the course of this year where we talked about, man, they're just fading this 40 handle. They're fading this 40 handle. Every move above 40, uh, they, they just don't, don't want to touch it. And now here we come into showtime, sir. 48 and a half, up another almost 4%, sir. Well, resistance is resistance till it gets broken and now it's support. Exactly. <laughs> so, and, and really, the, the, the longer those things hold and the more they get tested, it seems like the bigger the break to the upside is because more and more people uh, will, will be taking the other side of the market as they, they see it test 40. And then people that short at some point, they do have to buy back. I like that. Resistance is resistance until it becomes support. That's certainly what we've seen out here in all things WTI because, like I said, come into today's show, listeners, 48 and a half. WTI on our movers and shakers this week was at even on a very active week to the upside with a legion of green products on the screen. It was still number three, uh, only behind silver and Bitcoin up there, up nearly 5%. So an impressive turnaround here for all things WTI. We had Eric on the show last week talking about what are some of the impacts of the resurgence potentially of crude oil demand on this, even though OPEC coming out recently, maybe dampen down those fires a little bit, re- revising some of their demand forecasts for next year. But that was kind of a short-lived blip in the upside. It kind of sold off and came right back, kind of like the reverse of what we saw in the past, where in the past, if you saw any upside, it was short-lived and went right back down. Now, anything to the downside, reverse, right back up uh, really quickly. Folks got their, got their hands out. The, uh, the bulls are out with their horns here for all things crude oil. Come into Showtime, we're seeing... Coming in on 300,000 contracts on the tape here for WTI. So a pretty active week out here. The most active contract is coming in the Feb part of the cycle here. I don't see Feb on the list too often. That's kind of interesting. About 28% of the paper going up in that Fed contract. It has about 28 days left to dance, so we'll hang our hat out there. If you're wondering right now, the At The Money Vol in the Feb contract... Almost 32.5, about 32.4. That's off about 3.5 points from where it was lately. And you know, if you've been paying attention to this show, you know that crude vol has come in quite a bit. It was north of 60 for a while there, which puts it in almost Bitcoin territory. Hard to sustain that for a long time. And Bitcoin, still very volatile, but now about half of where it was uh, not too long ago. And again, off another 3.5 points this week. Skew-wise out here in this Feb contract, the puts... We're almost 9% rich to the at-the-money last week. This week, they're 14, almost 14.5% rich to the at-the-money. So the puts are still where the bid is. This is shaping up to be a very equity-style skew now with the, with the puts bid and the calls offered here. The calls were 5.5% cheap this week, 7.8% cheap. So as we keep busting through these strikes to the upside, uh, we're seeing the skew kind of rotate. You know, uh, the calls come in and the puts get bid. Let's look out here. Not a lot of shifting or sliding, really. Uh, sliding up the curve, I should say. Not a lot of shifting of the curve. If you want to break that down for yourself, click on that column on the TWIFO report. It's pretty fascinating to see how much the skew travels along the path versus actually moves, the actual skew shape actually. Remember, skew is just kind of a best guess of what's going to happen. It's not written in stone, and sometimes that best guess is wrong. So what happens with that? That shift and slide number breaks that down a little bit, which is kind of fascinating out there. Let's see what the hot contract is out here this week. If you said... All this upside means everyone's looking past 40 to the 50 strike. You would be correct. The 50 calls in Feb leading the dance this week. 10, almost 11,000 contracts on the tape for far and away. Actually, I take that back. It was usurped ever so briefly going all the way out to September of next year. We got the the 40 puts doing 13,300, so just snatching away. The number one spot, about 11,000 of the 50 calls were going up. But we got to go out to SEP. SEP 40 puts. <laughs> so that kind of back what we were just talking about. Some people may be fading this. Either way, 64.50 going up yesterday. 68.50 going up today on these 40 puts. Looks like it might be a bit of a uh, funky 
funky fly slash three way up here is a 45 puts also went up 3,800 times yesterday, 4,000 times today. And the 30 puts went up 3,200 times yesterday and 3,200 times today. So it does seem like related paper. It looks like maybe the uh, 45, 40, 30 fly went up there, you know, one by two by one. That could, and also maybe with a, a 36 kicker and also, 36 puts also traded 1,600 times. So a lot of funky downside puts traded in. In September here in WTI, maybe a bit of a fly. I'll have to dig into that one a little bit. But pretty much all that paper, at least Wednesday and probably today, unless they took it all off today, uh, was opening, which is fascinating. And a lot of paper here uh, going up. So, yeah, let's see. September actually accounted for about just those puts alone, about almost 14 percent of the paper out here this week. So that's a lot of trading and downside. So maybe maybe we shouldn't write off the 40 strike just quite yet. Uh, out here. The 50 calls, though, were also pretty active, like I said, out here in February to the tune of about 11,000. The big days were Monday and Wednesday with about 3,400 ETH, both of those days opening, and then about 3,000 on the tape today. So a lot of folks going after that 50 strike, maybe not surprising given the price action we've seen out here of late. Let's look really quickly, see any other weird prints. Weirder than those 40 puts. That's a lot of set puts lighting up the tape. 30 puts trading a thousand times out here in Dece of 2022. That seems so far away, yet it isn't that far anymore. A lot of funky paper. Mr. Rose, what are your thoughts here on this this final breaking of the camel's back, at least for now, WTI maintaining itself above 40? Any of the interesting volume or volatility or skew developments you've seen out here over the course of this week? And then what are your thoughts on maybe a funky uh, downside put fly here in WTI this week, sir? That downside put fly, I, I somebody's getting really specific on that, and uh, I assume they're not risking a whole lot if we end up going up to the upside, which is really what things look like right now. Um, you know, you've got such low volume, like you said, you basically described it perfectly when you said that the skew for crude oil looks like equity skew right now, and when I see something like that, I, I and and a lack of resistance. Uh, you know, I, it'd be a great user poll. Uh, are we going to be over sixty or under for, under forty first? And I would I would totally be betting on the sixty price level first. Hmm, maybe we need a quick flash poll. I'm not sure if we can get it okay. in before the end of the show. Let's see if we can task our producer with an extra special flash poll. Producer, one hour only. Will WTI hit the sixty handle first? Or the 40 handle. Which handle will it hit first? We'll see if we can get the results before the end of the show. A fascinating one. But Mr. Rhodes, we already hit on some hot ones. We hit on equities. We hit on crypto. We hit on WTI. But you're our guest. We got a little bit of time before we got to bring on the listening crowd out here. What other products are lighting up your tape this week, sir? I'm not going to say interest rates. I thank you for that because they're not on any of our lists. <laughs> they're not doing I, I anything. <laughs> I, 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 I'm kind of interested about soybeans. They were the one um, you know, crop that showed up in a big move to the upside this past week. Well, let's see if we can make that happen, listeners. Go to your drop down, go to ags, then go to grains and oil seeds, and you will see soybeans there in that list along with wheat and corn and everything else out there. And if you were to do such a thing you would see come into showtime we're seeing soybeans just north a little bit north of that 1200 level 1201 and a half in that front future that has about oh about a day to go out there as usual with the ags you know their rules of engagement they tend to aggregate around certain contracts in this case it's the uh the jan contract with a with a week to go doing about 34 and a half percent of the paper here in certain don't see that often that that much near dated paper in the ags. Usually it's it's spread out a little bit more. But it sounds like a lot of paper here on the Jan contract. And then beyond that, let's see really quickly. We go all the way all very close as well to the March content. That's that makes more sense. We just did soybeans recently and there was a lot of paper out there in March as well, which obviously lines up around the uh, the planting and harvesting cycle here for the soybeans here. Let's go out to the to the March cycle, because that's a little bit saner number than something with a week to go here. That future coming in is at 1205.75. It's up, let's see, the vol is about 22.5 in soybeans. So that's actually pretty rich for the ags, up about a point again here this week. And let's see, the most active contract out here looks like it was the 1200 calls and kind of pick your month. It was active. In that Jan contract that's going away in about seven days, about 15,000 going up there. Active again on the March contract as well, about 10,000 
going up there. So total 25,000 contracts going up just on that 12,000, excuse me, 1,200 strike uh, just in those two months. So that was pretty active. Let's go out to March. Let's see. The most active day for the 1,200s was yesterday, but almost 4,000 on the tape. 3,000 Tuesday, almost 3,000 again today. It's like a slightly closing to that. So maybe a little bit of that paper, again, not surprising as we, as we have vacillated and broken through that 1,200 strike, seeing a little bit of closing paper over there. Followed hot and heavy by looks like the again the 1200 calls in uh, in the jans going away this week they did 15,000 actually this week so they did even more let's look really quickly those have lion's share of those actually going up today so contracts going away a lot of probably clothes and paper but they were pretty active all week 5,000 today 4,000 yesterday and about 3,500 on monday about 3,000 on tuesday so a lot of action on this 12 100 strike. Let's look again back to March to check out the skew. The puts last week, 11.1% cheap. This week, 13% cheap. And the calls, 11% rich. This week, nearly 14% rich, 13.7. So calls getting some love out here. Puts getting a wee bit cheaper. Mr. Rhodes, I know you like to watch a little bit of ags. What's catching your eye out here in the beans, sir? Well, first, it, you talked about the 1200 line, um, you know, 15,000 uh, of the, the ones that expire in about a week. Uh, then you look at 5,000 of the Febs and 10,000 of the Marches. I wonder if there was just some rolling out to a little bit later dates using the 1200 strike. And just the, the, the way that I, you know, I'm looking at the uh, 25 Delta skew for both the put and the call on the March contracts. And they're almost the same number, uh, 11.1 versus 11.0. Uh, they, that's what makes a market, man. People don't know. You know it's, it's like people betting about the same in both directions on this one. So that might be the next. And, and when you see something like that, where it, whenever the skew is somewhat flat or or equivalent like that. I like to to think of that as being, uh, you know, there's an equilibrium between the bulls and the bears, or there's just a lot of people that are unsure. And when there's when we're unsure, it tends to break one way or another. So I'd definitely be keeping an eye on the the March contract, which expires in the middle of February. That's one of those things that, as an equity person, I always have to pay attention to is that the March contract doesn't trade through March, trades through February. That's always a, always a bit of a learning learning curve for all of our listeners coming from the world of equities. These contracts don't exactly line up, perhaps, the way you think. But you're right. March is where the action is. And the beans have been interesting to watch ever since the early days of this program. They've exhibited some interesting skew patterns. Interesting stuff to watch from a skew perspective. Also, interesting stuff you guys always send our way. So let's get at it with a little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Let's see what you guys have on the brain. First off, an interesting one here from TLET87. That rolls off the tongue. They want to know, does the lack of an early exercise premium make option writing less attractive in futures options versus standard stock options? Interesting question. Like we mentioned here on the show many times, a lot of these contracts coming at you on CME land, falling on the European Side of the fence, don't have that nice, juicy American early exercise premium baked in. So, Mr. Rhodes, uh, what do you have to say here for, let's call him Tlet87, just for fun. Does that make him less attractive to you, sir, not having that early exercise juice? Um, no. <laughs> um, not at all. I, I don't. You know, I I would never want to exercise early, and because you know, and the question is, does this make option writing less attractive? Uh, no, I think it makes it more attractive because you you don't have to worry about 
Uh, you mentioned there was a fly in uh, the oil complex. Well, you know, the fly involves some short legs, and uh, you don't want to have, you know, you, you, you don't want to be assigned early on those legs. So if anything, I'm, I'm all about European-style options versus American-style options. Yeah, from a, a security perspective, it certainly adds a little bit of extra sleep at night juice to it. And also, there are other extenuating factors when you're writing options. We talk about it here on the show all the time. The level of vol, the skew, and the skew is what can certainly make or break a lot of the option writing. Look at soybeans. You know, these things are bid. The different legs are bid all the time. The metals, the same thing. The equity is not so much. Usually, the puts are bid. The calls are offered out there. But the fact that the skews swing so wildly and move so much in the uh, futures options. That's what makes the option writing interesting. One week, the, the calls could be more attractive from a premium. Next week, it could be the puts. And so just focusing solely on the early exercise part, I think you're missing out on a lot of other interesting nuggets out there. I don't know, Sean, anything to add here for our creatively named listener, TLET87, sir? No, I, I just completely agree with Russell and, and you, Mark. Um, you know, European-style options are... Are, are sure things, n- n- no uncertainty, um, definitely more attractive, and the kind of style of options I would be trading myself. All right, next up, we've got Elgers. Elgers wants to know, what were the hottest movers and shakers of 2020? Well, Elgers, that's a great question, and I can't reveal the answer just yet, because A, 2020 is not over, but also B, we're kind of saving that. She spoiled my surprise for kind of a big, a kind of end of the year, hottest movers and shakers of the year episode. So let's look forward to that in your feed sometime before the end of the year, listeners, because obviously we're going to have holidays the next couple of shows here. It's not going to have any live twifos coming at you, but might have some fun stuff hitting the feed, including perhaps a fun a 2020 epic mover and shaker edition coming at you soon. So there you go, Elgers. You're letting the cat out of the bag here. My Christmas surprise early for the folks, but stay tuned for that. Listen, that should be fun. All right, next up we got uh, Bertrand, or perhaps Bertrand. Let's go with Bertrand here. Bertrand Thompson wants to know, where is nat gas demand by month's end? Well, interesting question, Bertrand. Let's go look it up here. You can go to nat gas yourself. Let's see what the options are. Are telling us. If you've been listening to this show for any length of time, listeners, you know NatGas is usually moving and shaking quite a bit out there, not the least of which because it's a very cheap contract, $2.66 coming into showtime. So you can have pretty sizable percentage swings without a lot of movement out there, which is kind of why NatGas is always dominating the tape and also why we don't break it down all the time just because the percentage swings are impressive, but it's still a small contract at the end of the day. Coming into today's show, like I said, 266. This, it's up almost 3%, 2.7%. So not quite breaking into our top five, a rear week where Nat Gas doesn't do it in one direction or the other. Looks like about nearly 40% of the paper coming in that Jan contract that's going away in about 11 days here. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's jump out to another month that's a little bit saner out here. Let's see where the other lion's share of the action was. Let's go out. Let's say to, let's say to March. <laughs> March did about 15% of the paper out. Actually, we can do we can do Jan. It has almost two weeks, so I'll be charitable. I'll allow it to sneak in under our list here. The vol here, 54 and a half off 11 points. If you go out to the Feb contract, it has about 40 days to go. That one has a vol of about 58. So that's where the vol is in terms of skew, which can tell us what the options are anticipating for demand. And you want to know by the end of the month. So we got to kind of look right around here. Uh, let's see. The puts were 1.1% rich last week. This week kind of unched about 0.2% bid. So they've come up a little bit. They got a little bit of bid, but there's not, not much going on. A quarter of a point bid. Uh, to the at the money, which is already pretty rich at 54 and a half. And the calls, 1.5% rich last week, this week, 1.7% cheap. So the calls have actually come in. I guess as we've rallied through some of those strikes, we've, uh, we've crushed that upside call skew a little bit, not a ton. We're talking about a three point net swing out here. In terms of the most action, the calls, three calls were leading the tape here with about 25,000 in this Jan contract. So it seems like some folks are still looking for some moves up to. That three strike or perhaps overriding it and uh, expecting us not to break through. So I guess demand, where does demand by month end? It looks like we're seeing a little bit of, uh, actually the calls have come in. So it seems like we're kind of uh, right now hovering at kind of a, eh, kind of a shoulder shrug out here. Not seeing a lot of juice being priced in in either direction in this near-term contract here in terms of skew. 
out here, Bertrand. So maybe that's kind of showing maybe the market thinks we're kind of hovering here. For the next uh, few weeks, Mr. Rhodes, do you follow Nat Gas A and B? Do you have anything to add here for our listener? Uh, let's, let's go French and Bertrand. Bertrand? Uh, the, isn't Nat Gas the Widowmaker? It certainly can be, sir. It, it, it almost was to me at one time. So we, we have this trading term called the putting things in the penalty box. It's something I try not to have an opinion about because I don't want to become a widow. I don't want my wife to be a widow quite yet. Is that analogous when you almost jumped in on those uh, 20 cent crude oil futures before they went negative? (laughs) Oh, yeah. How much lower can it go? How much? 20 cents. That's all you're risking, (laughs) sir. Yeah. So that's that's my trying to be cute way of saying that net gas. uh, I that's a that's a tough market for me and one that I don't generally have an opinion on. Sorry. Yeah, this is a hard one here at Bertrand because it looks like it's pricing in a lot of juice, which means it can move, but not a lot of bias in one direction or the other from a skew perspective. So it's kind of hard to say, hey, they're looking for a ton of upside. The calls have all come in as we've rallied, though. So the calls were almost 10% bid last week in February. Those have come in. 5% rich in March. Those have come in. So not a lot of upside premium, and the puts are all kind of unched or kind of near unched to the downside as well in terms of being bid or offered to the at the money. So it doesn't seem like the skew is pricing in much direction beyond where we are right now, but there is a lot of juice, so it can move. This doesn't seem like there's any bias. It's hard to say a nat gas demand here, at least from an options analytics perspective. If you want the fundamental breakdown, of course, go, go write a nat gas analyst. We're looking at the options here, Bertrand. But interesting stuff here. It seems like maybe a rear week where they're pricing in we shoulder shrug. We don't know where Nat Gas is going as it hovers around this 265 level. Unfortunately, that music means we know where the show is going. It's going right to the recording bin so we could send it off to the editors and make a fun show. Oh, before we go, let's check in, Mr. Rhodes. I think our producer has managed to get the flash pull out. Yes, they did. And Mr. Rhodes, take a guess. What do you think is winning your flash poll right now here as the show comes to an end? We asked, what level will WTI crude oil hit first, 40 or 60? What do you think is winning? I know it's winning because I'm looking at it because I voted. Oh, you cheat. I don't want to cheat. So <laughs> you, you, can make, you can make I didn't vote. Choice. All right, Sean, so, you didn't, didn't vote. vote. You get to play. What do you think is winning? 40. Interesting. No, it's really it's really funny because it, it actually sixty percent of the people are voting for sixty and forty percent of the people are voting for forty right now. Funny how statistics works. But there we go. Our yeah. audience ever so slightly biased to the upside. Look, I thought forty might pull it out as well, Sean. But no, they're looking at sixty next here. Uh, with some people flocking in, it's only been live for a few minutes, so we'll see how this goes. It's a flash poll, only up for about an hour, listeners. So if you're not listening live, you probably missed your chance. But right now. Here, 60% of the folks saying 60. Again, kind of hard to argue with that given what we've seen of late. doesn't take a big move given what we've seen another couple of weeks like this, and we'll be there. So interesting stuff, but also someone putting on it's like a size downside fly out there. So a lot of interesting stuff to watch here in WTI. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's start with our guest, Mr. Rhodes. If folks are intrigued and want to check out maybe some of your research you're, you're working on over there, maybe check out your new book. Where should they go? What should they do? A new book is on Amazon and uh, eqderivatives.com. Anything that I write about the markets, I put in front. I get to put in front of the firewall. And um, I'm definitely going to be putting something up about different ways to to trade uh, a small cap outperformance next year. It's something I've already started doing some work on even before I knew I was coming on today. And really quick, if folks want to check out your book, what's it called? Your new book. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Vix Trader's Handbook. There you go. Vix Trader's Handbook. Just look for it over there on the old Amazons. And he spells his name not like the road you drive on or the island. It's Rhodes, R-H-O-A-D-S. So make sure you look for that over there. The Vix Trader's Handbook. And Mr. Sean, you guys are busy over there in the land of small caps. you got new products rolling out. you got new research all the time, new webinars in the tape, what should folks look forward to from the land of FTSE Russell these days, sir? Well, if you want to reach me, it's uh, sean.smith at lseg.com. Um, email me any of your questions, but if you want some really good, valuable information regarding the performance of small caps versus large caps or small caps uh, because of the, uh, the COVID vaccine or if you want to talk about international mar- or listen to webinars about 
international markets. We have just a, a plethora of fantastic information at footsierussell.com slash blogs or footsierussell.com slash webinars. Uh, please visit our website. There's just fantastic information there. And Russell, great to have you on the show today. And Mark, it's always a pleasure to be here with you. There you go. FTSERussell.com slash blogs and slash webinars. You guys have been asking all year for research and analysis, not just on small caps, but impact of COVID on the marketplace. It's all there and a whole bunch more, including some cool webinars. FTSERussell.com is the place to go. You know where to go. Check out our show. Check out the reports we're talking about. Research. Just had Eric on last week with all sorts of great research and a variety of different products that he and Blue and the rest of the team are working on. It's just CME Group. You can go to slash twifo or slash twio for our reports. And, of course, for everything else, hit the education tab. They have links to this show. So for some reason you can't find it, (laughs) go there. You can find it as well as all the research and everything else they're doing over there, including the info on these new ETH futures that I know you guys are excited about. And on behalf of Mr. Rhodes and Sean, everybody over there in FTSE land and everybody over there at CME Group and, indeed, myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing And, of course, we're making 2020 just such an epic year for TWIFO. Keep it coming, and we'll see you back here. Not sure about the next couple of weeks because of all the holidays coming up. We will get some more fun stuff in this feed. Don't worry. We may see you back here next year for another episode of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.